Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. In the current pandemic, we have seen men succumb to COVID-19 at far greater rates than women. A lot of theories have been expounded as to why. And most theories have to do with the disease itself and its inherent impact on the human body. The fact is, though, that the reasons may be more fundamental, that they transcend the disease and are directly related to a deeper biological difference between men and women. Differences that have an application in the treatment of virtually every disease, from colds to cancer. Clearly, the difference in chromosomes may be the ultimate customization of medicine. We're going to talk about that today with my guest, Dr. Sharon Maolam. He's an award-winning scientist, physician, and New York Times best-selling author. And his latest work, which couldn't come out at a more opportune time, is entitled The Better Half on the Genetic Superiority of Women. Dr. Sharon Moalam, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. Well, it's great to have you here. When we approach this subject, is it best to approach it from strictly a scientific perspective, or is there a cultural component that's at play here as well? Well, I think both have an impact on health outcomes. Uh, you know, we know the power of uh, changing one's behavior, um, you know, when it comes to um, resisting diseases and for longevity. But I think that the emphasis for far too long has been on behavior and uh, the cultural implications of um, behavior and their effects on um, our susceptibility to disease. And I think uh, this is really born out of the fact that we have been um, not so much as misinformed, but we just really misunderstood the fundamental differences when it comes to the biology of men and women. And, um, you know, they begin very early on in life. Uh, we see that as we see that those females have a survival advantage from the first day they are born. More girls make it to their first birthday than boys everywhere we look around the world, even in cultures where um, girls are not the, you know, the most favored sex. And so um, what I think really has happened, as you mentioned uh, in, your, in your opener with the coronavirus, is just this basic unmasking of a fundamental biological fragility uh, that males have compared to females. And although men may have more muscle mass, uh, you know, uh, greater height and weight on average, that comes at a cost um, since they don't have, uh, you know, the two same sex chromosomes. They have an X and a Y. And so fundamentally, females right from the get-go having two X chromosomes, one they inherited from their father, one they inherited from their mother, gives them an immense advantage in life. Doesn't it also have some downside in that we see women much more susceptible, for example, to autoimmune diseases? That's correct. And the reason is uh, twofold. First of all, uh, females have, which in most part, and for most of their lives, is an advantage. They have a very aggressive immune system compared to men. Their immune systems are much more likely to an attack an invader. Um, it takes a lot less to get them off the so-called immunological couch, uh, female immune cells to go and start attacking invaders. And so um, that can come at a cost when, uh, f when the immune cells decide to target the body itself, which happens in autoimmunity. And um, the other reason that this that will more women are affected um, from autoimmunity has to do with the fact that all females actually are mosaics. They're made up of two groups of cells, one using predominantly the X they got from their father and the other predominantly that they got from their, the X that they got from their mother. And so this mosaicism that females naturally have can predispose them to autoimmunity or friendly fire. When an immune cell is using one X and it encounters, uh, say, the X from the father, and it encounters another cell in the body that's using the X from their mother, it may think that that X is foreign and instigate an attack. Whereas I'm a genetic male, all my cells are X, Y, and they're all identical. So my immune cells have um, less a chance or, or like a lower propensity to attack cells just based on the fact that every one of my immune cells is, is fundamentally genetically identical to every other cell in my own body. Is there a consistency to all that, that you've been talking about as we look across different cultures? To what extent is there an epigenetic component that perhaps plays out differently in different social and cultural landscapes? Well, I think what was really overwhelming for me as, as I did, you know, as I 
um, took part in different clinical research projects over my career, um, and also as a physician, was this recurring theme that regardless where you look in the world, um, females have a survival advantage at every point in the life force, regardless of any type of behavior. And coming back to what I was talking about earlier, the easiest place really to isolate out biology uh, away from culture is at the beginning of life. And we see this immense survival that uh, happens that even when a, a boy and a girl are born into very challenging circumstances, say they lacked oxygen at the time of birth, boys always tend to struggle, not only have more risks for uh, further infections at birth, but also uh, to develop further complications later on in life from those challenges. And it really seems that this fundamental um, survival advantage that females have is connected to the fact that historically, from an evolutionary perspective, females, of course, and all mammals spend a lot of energy taking care of the young. So it's not just pregnancy, it's the early years of life. And so if one sex is to be advantaged genetically over the other, it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective for survival, ultimately, of the species to have the one sex that provides more care for their young to survive. And for mammals, that, that's the female. And we see the same pattern actually, but in reverse when we look at birds, because the male bird is the advantaged one when it comes from a genetics perspective, because it inherits the equivalent of, of XX. So it inherits ZZ chromosomes. And so when we look at male bird longevity, we see that male birds have increased longevity and many of the advantages that we find in um, uh, female mammals. And so when we try to understand, well, why does this happen in the case of birds, uh, researchers now have, have, have actually published an extensive study in the last year showing that um, male birds can provide much from a caloric perspective to their young. And so having one sex advantaged that helps the next generation survive ultimately helps the species survive. And while we talk about, and, and you write about how this impacts stamina and, and developmental issues and so many other areas, how does it play out psychologically? Well, I'd say when we look at the uh, organic functioning of the brain, the brain as a machine, um, and when you have so many genes that are involved in the making and maintaining of a brain that are on the X chromosome. So the X chromosome contains about 1,000 genes. Uh, humans have about 20,000. And so we, one would say, well, why would having you know an extra, an extra 1,000 uh, genes really give females that big of an advantage? Well, it turns out so many of the genes that are involved, not in only in, in immune function, but in the making and maintaining of a brain are on the X chromosome. So what that means for females, females really have an extra, you know, 1,000 copies of genes that they can dip into to build a very complex organ. And um, the one uh, explanation that I give in the book when I, I try to talk about females not only not having disadvantages, but having advantages that males might not have um, comes down to uh, an example of using vision. So to see color vision, humans have three genes. Two of them on the, are on the X. And that's why when we think about someone who's colorblind, we typically think of a male because uh, males only have one X. So if they don't have another backup copy, so if one of those uh, two genes on the X that are involved in color vision is defective, males go down from seeing 1, 000, 1 million colors, which is what an average um, person can see that can see colors, uh, differentiate between them. And they go down to only seeing, being able to differentiate 30,000 colors. So that, that's an immense difference. And so I was taught, of course, in medical school that females having this extra X chromosome is, is a backup. So if something's wrong with genes on one X, they have a backup and they can supplant that. And so that's why you know, when we look at colorblindness, five to 10% of people of European descent, males are colorblind and only 0.1% of females because females have this extra X that they can rely on. But it doesn't end there because it turns out that that extra X females can use those extra genes, not just as a backup, but to supplant and improve their color vision. And it turns out we think that somewhere in the, in the range of five to 20% of females have uh, almost like a vision superpower. It's called tetrachromatic vision. Instead of being see, instead of being able to differentiate between one million colors, as the average person with color vision can can see, um, these females can see 100 million colors. 
And so you can only imagine, we're only now starting to understand what, what benefits do females have by having these extra copies of these genes when it comes to neurological function. This is just an example when it comes to vision. And really, we haven't really even started to look to understand the impact of having this extra X chromosome. And to the degree to which we, we don't understand it fully, talk about the impact that you're seeing it have with respect to diagnosis of disease and ultimately treatment. Yes. And, and so when it comes to medicine and the basic differences between the sexes, outside of gynecology and obstetrics, it's very minimal. So again, I'm going back to my own medical training, um, when I was taught, you know, certain doses of drugs to prescribe, we would never differentiate between the sexes. We were always taught this was, you know, the a specific dose for an adult, or maybe some drugs we would adjust uh, for the weight of the patient, but never for the sex. And this goes back to the fundamental um, science, the basic research that led to drug development, where there was no requirement really to use males and females up until very recently. And even today, when we are in developing new drugs and doing the preclinical part of the research where we're using cells and animals, again, there's no requirement to use males and females. And so for many years, um, we, kept, um, we were kept really in the dark regarding the differences between the basic biology of men and women. And it's only recently when certain drugs uh, were noticed to have side effects in one sex over the other that now we're questioning whether what this was such a good idea. And uh, the one drug that I talk about in my book that, um, that made a very big difference regarding when it comes to the amount of, of drug and the sex that it's prescribed to is a drug called Ambien, Zolpidem, which is a sleep aid. And so um, normally we were taught the 10 milligram dose um, in the evening is what you would prescribe for an adult. And, and many of the women who are getting this dose were waking up the next day still feeling very groggy, still feeling sleepy. And enough women eventually complained to their physicians and physicians passed this information on. The FDA um, re-examined whether or not that's the right dose. And they came to the conclusion that, in fact, women were being overdosed and that the correct dose for women is five milligrams. And so... Again, most, most, if not all of the drugs that now are approved do not require this type of sex-specific dosing. And, and to correct this, what we really have to do, we have to have clinical trials that not only include men and women, but include enough males and females that we can actually find out what does the drug do in a male environment, what does it do in a female cellular environment. And, um, and I think what will happen over time, we'll discover... Um, that some drugs may not even work for one sex. Some drugs that are harmful for one sex may be helpful for another. And, um, but this, re- this is going to require a lot of work and some um, legislative changes because as currently the FDA doesn't require this preclinical research to include male and female cells and male and female animals. Going one step beyond that, as we look further and further to things like immunotherapy as treatment for cancer and similar kinds of diseases, it seems like it would have an even more profound impact there. Yes, and so there's a new class of um, drugs that target cancer They're called immune checkpoint inhibitors. And what these drugs do, they unleash the power that, that uh, is held back in reserve in the immune system, and that unleashing that extra vigor and um, aggressiveness allows the immune cells to better target cancers. And so when they were developing these drugs, um, using, again, mainly male cells, male animals, um, when eventually they did clinical trials, what they started to discover was um, the, these drugs work much better for males than they do for females. And why would that be the case? And again, it goes back to what I was saying previously, that in women, their immune system um, is already being stimulated by estrogens. Estrogens stimulate the immune system, whereas in men, sex hormones like testosterone inhibit the immune system. So um, men then benefit from having a little bit of a nudge when it comes to their immune system to help them target cancer. And this is likely also the reason why we, when we um, look at populations, we discover that is for in the U.S., for example, there's about 150,000 extra cases of cancers in males 
every year, which we, for, for the most part, attributed most of these sex differences to behavior. But now as we start understanding it, it's not only that more men are diagnosed with cancers, more men don't do well um, after they've been diagnosed. And again, it comes back down to the fact that there's these basic fundamental immunological, biological differences between the sexes. And this is some of what we're seeing in some of these COVID cases where we have the, this Im- overactive immune system response and these kind of cytokine storms. It is. But, but I think what we're actually seeing when we look everywhere, everywhere around the world now is about uh, a two to one increased male mortality when it comes to COVID-19. And um, it's probably the reason for this is multifactorial. Again, men don't have an aggressive immune response when it comes to viruses. And it also, though, has to do with the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, females are mosaics. And many of the genes on the X chromosome are involved in an immune function. There's a specific gene called TLR7 that, ta- that exactly targets RNA viruses, just like coronavirus. And so naturally, women are made up of cells that are using either the X from their father or the X from their mother. So they have two different versions of TLR7 that can detect the COVID virus. And so that's a very big advantage where all my cells, immune cells, have exactly the same version of that gene. And so having uh, immune cells that are using different genes and having an overall aggressive immune system is a big advantage. And again, there's stamina when it comes to surviving famines and pandemics throughout uh, human history. The same pattern has always held true. Men have come out as the biologically fragile sex. And interestingly enough, uh, or, from an, or unfortunately, I should say, the same two-to-one pattern of increased male mortality is um, you know, the same thing we've seen in, in other uh, extreme events um, that have happened in, in history, including you know, even recent um, events such as pandemics that have happened in Northern Europe, where many more men succumbed uh, to the lack of food and the hardships that were involved in those events. To the extent we are coming to understand all of this, will it provide a framework to customize drugs and treatments specifically for men based upon what we're learning in terms of how the female genetic makeup is more protective? And, and really, that's my hope. It's, it's this idea that we, we finally come to the realization that um, from a biological perspective, men are not women and women are not men, and that the um, sex chromosomes have this immense impact. So how can we start to study this? So, uh, you know, on a, on a very more, say, superficial level, um, you know, and based on the, on the extreme current need, um, you know, there's some trials underway and looking to see if, if we give men estrogens, could that then make a difference for their immune response in facing uh, the COVID virus. Um, and so, but I think really what we're going to start seeing is, is this re-examination and us going back to the lab and trying to understand both sexes and then being able to compare one to the other. So, you know, we've talked about many things today and for, for the big cost, again, that females face from having an aggressive immune system and cells using different axes is the propensity to autoimmunity. Well, if men don't get autoimmune to the same degree, is there something that we can learn from studying uh, male immune cells that make them less aggressive, that then we, we could apply to females and convince uh, female immune cells not to attack themselves or attack the body? And, and again, coming back full circle, uh, what else could we go back to understanding or researching um, the details of the female immune response when it comes to um, cancer surveillance within the own body, attacking viruses and microbes? And how can we then train male bodies and cells to really take advantage of uh, many of the female techniques that result in increased survival? To what extent is the medical community embracing this, understanding this, and beginning at least to incorporate it into day-to-day medicine? I think, unfortunately, from a day-to-day medicine perspective, except the one or two drug exemptions that I mentioned, men and women are treated in the same way. Um, physicians don't go into their drug formulary and, and look up which dose that they should be prescribing based upon sex. Because for the most part, that information doesn't exist for physicians. We don't have that information at our disposal because the FDA didn't require it when the drugs were approved. So um, in that sense, physicians really are, are at this point heading um, into uh, a treatment scenario blind. 
But from a research perspective, I think because of the, the mortality difference was so striking when it came to COVID that everywhere we looked around the world, it's two to one, that every behavioral argument that was initially given for the reason for this increased male mortality from the fact that men are dirty and don't wash their hands, which I find offensive, uh, to um, you know, increase um, tobacco use amongst men, which, which um, from, from many different perspectives made initial sense when the data came out from China. But then upon further, further investigation, it became clear that actually um, to recent tobacco use might, might be protective when it comes to uh, mortality in COVID-19. Uh, because it seems that in many of the countries that we have data, current smokers are underrepresented in the ICU and in deaths. And so all these behavioral explanations for the increased male mortality, as, as they fell one by one, we were left with, with the stark realization that the reason that more men are unfortunately dying has to be biology. As we have more women coming online as doctors and as re- primary researchers, Talk about the extent to which you think that will make a difference and how all of this gets addressed. Well, I think having, uh, you know, diversities of views and opinions always makes uh, the research community more interesting. And I, I think um, I, that the basic actual difference will only happen when we start requiring um, not just researchers of both sexes, but 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 cells and animals of both sexes. And, and this this might sound pretty straightforward, but um, the reason actually that there, there was resistance to including both sexes is that females are much more complex to study, even at the cellular level. And part of the reason is when you're dealing with a, a female mouse or, or a female human, um, the fact that half her cells are using one X and the other half are using another, and that proportion of cells is different everywhere you look in the body is really a level of complexity that we up until very recently didn't even have the tools really to approach and investigate. And so um, what that added was a level of variability in our in research results um, that then made findings much more complex to interpret. It was much easier to use male, male animals, for example, where all the cells are identical. They're all behaving in the same way, and the results are more reproducible. But again, if we're just going to be studying um, men and male cells and animals, um, we're doing a disservice uh, not only to women but to men because there's many things that we could be learning from studying female cells and female animals then that we can apply and help men as well. And one of the areas that this is relevant, particularly right now, and you write about this, is in reaction to vaccines. Yes. And so, again, coming back to the basic immune responses and the differences between the sexes, uh, when a man, an average man and woman get a vaccine, women, of course, report more side effects. And so for many years, it just thought that women are much more vocal. And, you know, first of all, more, more women tend to see their doctors on a regular basis. They're, you know, what I was taught in medical school was that, uh, you know, women will, will, will be forthright and will complain and tell you exactly what's wrong. But in reality, actually, what was happening, women were experiencing more side effects because um, they were reacting by design to the vaccine. They have a more aggressive immune response after the vaccination, and that's why they were getting these side effects. Their body was taking the the shot that they were given seriously, and they were beginning to produce antibodies and uh, the cells necessary to retain a memory of that infection so that later on in life, when they were exposed to it, they were ready uh, for an attack. Uh, on the other hand, you have the male immune response, which at times is not vigorous. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, men's immune cells are much lazier. It takes a lot of more energy to get them off that immunological couch, so to speak. And so that's why many men not only are not um, speaking about side effects, they weren't actually experiencing them because men, for many men, their bodies were actually ignoring the vaccinations or not taking them seriously. And so from a practical perspective, what this means that we're discovering now is that um, for a lot of uh, vaccinations, it could be that men actually require a higher dose of a vaccine to get a response. And women may require a lower one. And, and again, the more we study the basic fundamental immunological responses between the sexes, 
the better we are to help them both. And finally, doctor, how serious is all of this being taken now in medical schools and in research hospitals and really in the medical community that, that's looking at these kinds of issues? I think we're, we're, we're very early to have some practical uh, changes to happen, but I, I'm, I'm an optimist. I see uh, many academic centers um, you know, opening up either new divisions or new positions to look at, um, you know, the sex effects and the gender effects when it comes um, to health outcomes, because, uh, you know, the realization is that these effects have an incredible um, impact, you know, in when it comes to longevity. And, and, and I think uh, if anyone was trying to make an argument uh, regarding their importance, um, the unfortunate pandemic that we've experienced really, I think, has, has made that clear. Men and women are not the same. Um, you know, we shouldn't be treating them in the same way. We shouldn't be giving them the same drugs at the same doses because our basic biology is different. Of course, we're more, sim- we're more similar than we are dissimilar, but uh, the differences are crucial. And so I think this, again, this realization, looking at the two-to-one mortality when it comes to COVID-19 everywhere we look around the world, has really brought home uh, the need and I, and I think uh, the impetus for us to move forward to really start um, not just treating men and women differently, but to, to dig down deeper to understand these basic, important biological differences. Dr. Sharon Moalam, his book is The Better Half on the Genetic Superiority of Women. I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. Thank you.